Well, we're in our fourth week of um, 40 Days of Purpose, where we're desiring the Lord uh, to have a greater impact. At least I'm desiring, I hope you're desiring, desiring the Lord to have a greater impact in our lives because we're meant to have an impact in those around us. We're meant to bring that same impact into those around us. You know, we, we read today, and you, you see what happens with the Israelites that's taking place, and they're grumbling and they're murmuring in, in the midst of God's provision, and um, they rebel. They begin to rebel against God, and uh, as a result, judgment comes, and the snakes are sent and begins to bite them, and they begin to die, and then quickly they change their mind and say, hey, we need help. And in that help, um, Mo Moses gets a word from God to put a fiery serpent on a pole and lift it up, and that they look to that, they'll live. It didn't say they wouldn't be bit, but it said they'll live. And then it picks up again, we're going to read in uh, John's Gospel today, how uh, this, intercount this um, um, meeting that Jesus has with Nicodemus, and, and, and he begins by saying, just as uh, Moses lifted up, uh, the pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And we're talking about impact. We're talking about having an impression. And what I want you to understand that's taking place is that for us, what, what, what happened there with Moses and what's happening when we begin to understand the cross is that we're, we're actually taking a moment to face our fear. That's what we're looking into. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He took on our sin. When we look up, we're looking into our sin. When, when our greatest fear is our sinfulness. That's the greatest thing that we have to overcome. And we're afraid to look at what that is. But it's when we actually look at that, we're facing our fear for the first time. And we're, we're facing, we're acknowledging it so that we could be free. Then when we look up, we see the one who is without sin. We see our sin on him. And we see that he took that sin so that we can be free. That has an impact that leaves an impression into our lives. That's, that's what takes place when we encounter light in the midst of darkness. And about four weeks ago, I was praying, and the Lord gave me this word uh, um, just about the difference between that which is authentic and that which is counterfeit. And he, and he brought it to my memory of just uh, of things that are authentic, and I began to pray and say, Lord, I don't want to be a phony. I don't want to be counterfeit. I want to be authentic. I want to worship you authentically. I want the church to know you in that way. I want to live our lives that way. But I believe for most of us, that's true. We would desire that which is authentic over something that's counterfeit. Why on earth? Unless you know you're going to make a purchase that's counterfeit because you can't afford the real thing. Other than that, the knockoff is suffice. But not in our spiritual life. You know, we, we do that. We make purchases every day because we're a bunch of consumers, and that's what we do. And we make purchases, and the things that we purchase, we expect to get what we paid for. We expect it to be authentic. And we have to be careful in purchases we make, even in the light of using something like Amazon, where it's something that you enjoy. It's the exact product that you want. Uh, if you don't watch, the product may come up and look exactly like the one that you've purchased before, that, that authentic one. And if you don't read the fine print or if you don't look, what comes in the mail is a replica. What you wind up getting is not what you thought you wanted. You were deceived by what you saw. You, you were deceived by that very thing, and it's, it's not the authentic one. Consumer reports, uh, counterfeits that, that, that take place on a regular basis, mostly in our consuming, not when it comes to money. That's a whole other problem. But in things that we purchase as consumers, you know what the number one thing is that's counterfeited across all other material items is shoes. Shoes is the biggest counterfeit. That's the biggest knockoff. So you better check your shoes, make sure you got the right ones. <laughs> Clothing, leather goods, electronics, cosmetics, toys, watches, jewelry. Uh, the count counterfeit counterfeiting is the largest criminal enterprise in the world over everything else. It estimates over $3 trillion a year 
is generated through counterfeit, through the things that are counterfeit. And when something is counterfeit, it's made in the exact imitation of something valuable with the intention to deceive and defraud. The counterfeit's intention is deception and defrauding. That's its intention. And when something's authentic, there's an unquestionable evidence that takes place that says this thing is genuine. There's evidence in it. It says this is authentic. It, there's a way to authenticate it. You get experts that come in and take something and say, because I'm an expert, I see why this is authentic, not a counterfeit. That they can prove it, that it's, it's the genuine thing. And one of the shows I like to watch is called Pawn Stars, where people bring in their items and everyone thinks they got a family heirloom worth millions of dollars. You know, my great great grandmother left this for me, and they go, and it's that moment like, I'm cashing in now, grandma, you know? Or, or, or they went to, you know, some flea market or uh, someone having a garage sale, and like, they think they got the holy grail. Like, this is it. And they come in and they bring their things in. People don't pawn like they used to. Now it's just kind of buy and sell. They bring their thing in to cash out on what I'm going to get. And one of the items uh, that came in in one of the shows was uh, someone brought in a Monet. And now I don't know if you know about the artist Monet, but, but Monet has paintings that sell for like $80 million. And the person brings in the Monet painting and uh, brings in some documentation, said it was hanging in the museum in Los Angeles, you know, and you're watching, you're like on the edge of your seat, like, wow, this guy's going to cash out. And they said, well, what do you want to do with it? Well, of course, he's not going to, you know, uh, pawn it. He's going to sell it. He says, how much do you want for it? He goes, $1 million. And being a good businessman, he says, okay, uh, well, let me call an expert. Because I need an expert to come in to authenticate if this is a real Monet or not. You know, the people are like, I welcome the expert. Bring the expert in. That'll be great. Here's my documentation, all the information. The expert comes in and begins to look over the uh, painting and doing what an expert does in art and, and going through it. And uh, finally, the expert says, okay, can we turn it around and take it out so I can see the back of the canvas? And looks at the back of the canvas, puts the painting back down, and he says, um, this is a counterfeit. It's not authentic. And, of course, to the surprise of the person who brought it in, who was just, you know, in their head spending the million dollars <laughs> that they were sure they were getting two minutes earlier, and then begin to dispute with the one who authenticates it that, no, you don't know what you're talking about. This is real. And it's very simple. The one who authenticates the painting, the expert, looks at it, and he says, well... Monet's known for using thick paint as an artist in all his artwork. And when he uses that thick paint, inevitably, the strokes come through the back of the canvas and you can see it. And on the back of this canvas was blank, which proved it was not an original Monet. When it comes to understanding that which is authentic and that which is counterfeit, that there's evidence, there's an impression left that tells us this is the real thing. And when it comes to our spiritual life, we have to determine, do I want an authentic relationship with God or will I settle for a counterfeit? Will I settle for less? Many settle for less versus that which is genuine. But what I know is we're called into a genuine relationship, an authentic relationship with a living God. And in the beginning of John chapter 3, there's a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And uh, he's a member of the Sanhedrin, the highest council of the ruling body of Jews. And, and we know that he sneaks out in an evening to go meet up with Jesus. Nicodemus, is, he's highly regarded as a public figure amongst the Jewish people. He, he believes in everything that he is, that he's as authentic as a Jew can come. He wears all the right stuff. He prays all the right prayers. He goes to temple. He, he does all he gives. He does all the things. And, and, and he's one who's above all the other Jews. And he's believing that he lives as authentic as a life can be. But something's going on. That, that in the midst of what he believes to know, 
Nicodemus is in the middle of a faith crisis. That there's something going on that he doesn't understand. And, and he needs to go and investigate, is this Jesus guy authentic or is he another counterfeit? Is he just going to be another prophet or, or you know, uh, another priest or another rabbi or another... Or could he be the real thing? So being an expert, he should be one who could look at the back of the canvas and tell if it was real or not. He can authenticate it. And when he meets Jesus, he acknowledges him as rabbi, as teacher. And he says, your rabbi and teacher, that, that, that comes from God. He says, your man who's come from that, I don't dispute. You're a man who came from God. Because I seen miracles that take place. I understand you're a man that came from God. The miraculous signs would not be possible, he says, unless God was with him. Unless God was with you, these signs wouldn't be possible. And Jesus tells him, no one, his response, no one can see the kingdom of God, what you search for, unless they first become born again. He says that's the step that has to take place. And that's what you need to understand, Nicodemus. Now, we don't have time to read everything. Go back and read John chapter 3, and the whole born-again thing. How can you come out of your mother's womb again? And Nicodemus is, was missing it. Jesus challenges him. He's like, you're a teacher of the law. You don't get this? How do you not get this? How do you not see what you've been reading all these years in front of you? And then he goes on as he's teaching Nicodemus of what that truth is in John 3, 16 through 17. Scripture we might be familiar with. Maybe you're hearing it for the first time. And it says, For God so loved the world that what, church? He gave his only Son, that whoever would believe in him, what? Would not perish, but have eternal life. It's good. We get that. It's a, it's a summation of the gospel in some sense that we can understand what's the gospel about. John 3, 16. God loves, God gives, and what he's done for us. But we have to continue to read to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, through his son. Not to bring condemnation, but to bring salvation through his son. An authentic Christian life, what we have to understand what it's built on, where it begins, it built on a foundation of repentance and faith. That's what we begin to build our relationship with who Jesus is. There has to be a renewing of our mind, a change in our direction, and what we believe. If you don't have that, you're not a Christian. If you don't have repentance, you're not a Christian. You don't have faith. Because it would convict us to look up and recognize our sin and a need to turn from it. So that's where the authenticating begins for a Christian life. It's about recognizing your need for God's love and surrendering your life to Jesus. Authentic faith in Jesus is a willingness to bring our life of darkness into the light of Christ. That's what it means to be authentic, that I'm going to bring my life of darkness into the light of Christ. March 26, 1991, 33 years ago this month, almost a week or so away, um, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood him in that moment. And my life was dark, isolated, sinful, without God. I knew God. And I believed that he was really angry at me. I didn't know his love. But I knew I needed to change something in my life because I didn't like the life I had. I knew there was darkness and I knew it wasn't the life I wanted, but I didn't know how to get out of that life and choose a light or a life in light. And I had a friend and the night before that, uh, we kind of made this pact, like starting tomorrow, we're going to really change our lives. <laughs> Tonight we'll hang out. Tomorrow we're going to really make a change. <laughs> this is one more night. March 25th, 1991. And, and it was the idea that, that you know, we're going to go through the buddy system to make a real life change. And for me, 
you know, there was no rope left, and, and I knew I had to make a change because uh, what was left was um, not the life that I wanted. And that next day, I went to meet with him. Um, we were going to go to a meeting together and begin this journey of change. And I didn't really want to go, but I knew I had to go. I didn't really want to be there, but I knew that I was hopeless, and maybe I'd find hope in a change in my life. And when I showed up to my friend's house, he shows up to the front door in a towel, and he says, um, my clothes are not ready in the dryer yet. I can't come. And the difference was that day I made a decision to walk out of darkness into light, and he didn't. He chose darkness. He chose an excuse. And he's battled with that darkness for 33 years of his life. So much so, he's been in our bridge house multiple times where we've tried to help bring him into that light and change. There has to be a willingness, a recognizing our need for God, his love, our surrendering. An authentic faith in Jesus is, is a willingness to bring a life of darkness into a light of Christ. And it's only when we live in the shadows, we fear the light. And when we live in the shadows, we fear the light. And you know what we are? We're counterfeit. We're not the real thing. It's not the life that we're meant to have. We're deceived. It goes on in John chapter 3, verse 19. Jesus says this. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people... Love darkness instead of the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. They love darkness more than the light because of how they behave. He goes on, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear of what? What they do will be exposed. If I bring that into light, everyone will really know who I am. It's the condemnation of the enemy that leaves us in darkness. If people find out who I really am, they won't love me. People find out who I really am, I'll be exposed. If I really look up and see my sin, I'll be judged. I'll be outcast. And it's Absolutely a lie and not truth. But the problem is we stay stuck because of our deeds and our behaviors and the fear of bringing that into light. When we live in darkness, we're deceived. We choose darkness as a result of our deeds. We don't have to choose darkness. We can choose light. We can choose life. But because of our behaviors and actions, we choose the darkness. And those who are trapped by evil live in a dark place. They're deceived. And they hate the light. And they hate the light because light will expose those very deeds. It'll bring out those very deeds. The counterfeit life is a trap. It's a place where we're left feeling shame and guilt and isolation. And I know what that life's like. And I know what it's like to finally surrender and let light come into my life. I know what it's like to continue to live a Christian life and allowing God to expose areas so that I don't fall into those traps and fall away. And to live an authentic life in Christ means that we got to align our actions with our beliefs. It's not enough just to say, I know Jesus. There's a response. To be authentic in your faith, your action needs to line up with what you say you believe. There's a response to it. There's, There's an action step to what I believe. In verse 21, Jesus says, but people who do what is true, come to the light so that the things 
they do for God may be clearly seen. That there's actually things they do for God. The action, not just what I believe. And there's evidence of what God authenticated. There's evidence in each, there should be evidence in each of our lives, more than a changed inwardly heart, but an outward fruit as a result of it. That there's evidence in my action, in my behavior, in the way I love people around me, in how I treat my family, in how I, I, I honor my job, in my workplace, and people in my life. There's an outward action that reflects what I believe. And if my actions are not reflecting my belief, I've got to come out from the shadows. I've got to be willing to expose light to those very places. Now, here's what I want to give you. Six actions to authenticate your faith. Six things that will begin to authenticate your faith. First action is connect daily. You could do any one. You could do all of them, one of them, start anywhere you want. But I'm going to give you six to pick and choose. I think they're all necessary to apply to a disciple's life. But I want you to hear this. Connect daily. If you're not connected into the life of the community, you're not growing within Christ the way he wants you to grow. If you're not in fellowship, if you're not in a community group, if you're not coming to church, if you're not connected to the body of Christ, if you're not connected in those relationships, you're going to live isolated. And then shadows come and light can't be exposed. We need to be connected daily. Second, we need to pray fervently. I don't care how you pray, just pray. But you got to begin somewhere. And it needs to be consistent. It needs to be regularly. Because we need to build that relationship in to allow more light to come into our life so that our actions can match what we believe. Serve faithfully. That there's, there's something we do in a gift that we're given within the body of Christ. Give generously as a response to all the generosity that God so loved us. He gave his only son. He gave. He loved. He gave. Two actions. Love and give. Next, share passionately. Share with someone who Christ is in your life because they need to come out of the darkness into the light. And finally, love unconditionally. We are not allowed to put condition on love. We're called just to love. Matter of fact, even our enemies. That's the way our action responds to what we believe. I want you to identify one area, one of these places, so you could begin to live out a more authentic faith. You could begin to live out the very thing that you're called to and, and begin to live that out. So pick one action that you'll begin to live out, but here's the thing, you've got to tell someone about it. Because once you tell someone about it, it becomes real. Now it's called accountability. Now I'm going to take this next action step in my, in my journey, in my faith, in my walk. Tell your community group. Tell a friend. Tell a family member. Tell somebody. Tell your dog. Whatever it takes, you're going to speak it into. Your goldfish. I don't care. Tell someone. Your cat. Tell someone. I'm taking this one step. I'm going to start by connecting. I'm going to start by praying. I'm going to start by serving. I'm going to start by giving. I'm going to start by sharing. I'm, I'm going to start by loving that my, my belief will match that which I behave, that outward sign. Christianity is not about fake it until we make it. And there are people in church who don't believe. There's evidence that authenticates our life in Christ. There's evidence that authenticates who he is and what he's done in our life. So we can't just show up. We can't fake that relationship. There's a response to God's love for us. There's a response in his love for us and how we love those around us. So believing in Jesus leads to this internal life and the way we live our life should reflect his light in our life. And, and, and ask the Lord for grace because he'll give it to you. 
It says, by grace through faith that, that we come to this salvation. Grace isn't a one-time deal. It's a daily thing that God pours out. Ask for grace to increase faith, to have that consistency, and then that we would make our actions reflect the very things that we believe. The authentic life embraces the transformational power of faith in Christ. This is the only way to live a life that is true to yourself and pleasing to God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you know the areas of our lives where in the church, Lord, as ones who say we believe, there are some shadows. We need help. And then there are those, because of their deeds, choose darkness. And what I could tell you this morning is the Lord's calling you out from the shadows, now from that dark place, to come and know who he is. He who became sin, who knew no sin, died for us so that we can be reconciled to the Father and have an eternal life. So what do I do? It's a change of heart. It's a change of the way you think and the way you behave when you come to that relationship with who he is. It's a surrendering. So I just offer you a prayer that you could begin that transformational power in your life by knowing him. And if you want to pray after me to know him in that way, just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I open my heart, my mind, and I, I ask you, Lord, come in. Now lead my life, direct my life in the path that it should go. And make me the disciple that you've called me to be, to live what I believe. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now if you prayed that with me, what I want you to know is whether you're renewing it or it's the first time, that you've got to tell someone, one of us, because we want to help you on a pathway to grow in that faith, to grow in that light. You'll discover God's power, purpose, God's plan for your life, that there's a purpose in this discipleship pathway. Amen?